Okay guys, so this week we're going to talk about the endocrine system. Uh, the endocrine system uh, consists of glands, all the glands shown here, as well as um, some clusters of hormone secreting cells in various organs like the brain, the heart, and the small intestine. These glands secrete chemicals called hormones, and these hormones influence almost every cell and organ in the body. Endocrine glands do not have ducts, they secrete their hormones directly into the bloodstream. And cells of many different organs are exposed to a particular hormone, but the hormone itself will only act on the cells that have the receptors for that hormone. Those cells are called target cells. So organs or um, cells with those target cells are the only ones who are, who are going to respond to one particular hormone. Now you remember I said um, the nervous system controls most of what your body does, pretty much every part of your body, so does the endocrine system, but they do it in different ways. Uh, as you can see here, the endocrine system, it uses hormones. The nervous system uses neurotransmitters. Um, and then the endocrine system distributes those hormones into the bloodstream to be sent around to the body. The nervous system uses trans neurotransmitters into a synapse. The endocrine system is a slower response, whereas the nervous system is uh, very quick. But because the endocrine system responds slowly, it also has a longer lasting effect. The, nervous, the effect of the nervous system is pretty short lived. It can uh, adapt pretty quickly. The endocrine system sometimes takes a little longer just because of the way that it works. There are different classifications of hormones because of course, why would there only be one? You know, how confusing our bodies can be. They're classified as either steroid or non-steroid. And a good way to remember that steroid homo hormones are made from cholesterol. Non-steroid hormones are protein-based, so they're made from amino acids. Once a hormone reaches its target cell, it binds with a receptor to trigger the changes within that cell. Steroid hormones pass easily through the cell's membrane. Remember that membrane is semi-permeable. And then once inside the cell, it binds to the receptors in the nucleus. The protein-based or the non-steroid hormones can't penetrate the cell wall. They're too big. They bind to receptors on the surface of the cell. That binding then um, activates a second messenger system, and then a cascade of processes results in the production of a second messenger. The second messenger activates specific enzymes. The enzymes influence the cellular reactions that produce the cell's response to that hormone. So let's talk about some of the hormones that are in your endocrine system. First one is the pituitary gland. Um, pituitary gland is the one that really influences more body processes than any other gland in your endocrine system. It's about the size of a pea and it sits underneath the hypothalamus. You remember the hypothalamus from the brain um, up inside uh, your brain and in the, in the skull. Um, it lies actually in the cella tercica, that's the cavity within the sphenoid bone. And then there's a stalk called the infundibulum that connects the hypothalamus and the pituitary together. And then the pituitary, of course, some more subdivisions, is actually two, two different glands together. The anterior pituitary, also known as the adenohypophysis, and you can remember that they both start with A. And then the posterior pituitary is called the neurohypophysis, and they both do different things or actually different types of tissue. The anterior pituitary is the larger of the two, uh, and it, this is the one that consists of glandular tissue. It secretes a number of really important hormones um, under the direction of the hypothalamus. Neurons within the hypothalamus make what is known as releasing hormones, and those releasing hormones uh, stimulate the anterior pituitary to secrete hormones it produces. And then the hypothesis also makes inhibiting hormones and they suppress hormone secretion by the anterior pituitary. Neurons of the hypothalamus release their hormones into a system of blood vessels called the hypophyseal portal system. That's spelled H-Y-P-O-P-H-Y-S-E-A-L. So the hypophyseal portal system, the blood travels straight to the anterior pituitary where the hormones from the hypothalamus act on the target cells in the pituitary, causing them to release their hormones into the general circulation. The hypothalamus releases uh, several different hormones. Uh, each of these act on the anterior pituitary to either release or inhibit um, a particular hormone. 
Uh, for example, like the thyrotropin releasing hormone that uh, stimulates the uh, anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. That then goes to the thyroid and stimulates the thyroid to secrete its hormone. Uh, you will need to know the action of these hormones and you're also going to need to know that they come from the hypothalamus. The anterior pituitary itself makes um, even more hormones because, you know, why would we make it easy? Uh, thyroid stimulating hormone we just talked about that stimulates the thyroid gland. Prolactin stimulates milk production in the mammary glands in females. And in males, it may make the testes more sensitive to the luteinizing hormone. Um, Adrenocorticotropic hormone stimulates the adrenal cortex to secrete corticosteroids. Follicle-stimulating hormone, which is a gonadotropin, stimulates the production of eggs in the ovaries of females and sperm in the testes of males. The luteinizing hormone, also a gonadotropin, stimulates ovulation and estrogen and progesterone synthesis in females and the secretion of testosterone by the testes in males. And then the growth hormone, also known as somatotropin, that acts on the entire body to promote protein synthesis, lipid and carbohydrate metabolism, and bone and skeletal muscle growth. So your pituitary is a busy little gland. Makes a lot of stuff. The posterior pituitary, this is actually neural tissue. It's not glandular tissue. So it doesn't make its own hormones. It actually stores hormones that are um, made by the hypothalamus. It stores antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. Oxytocin stimulates contraction of the uterus during childbirth and triggers the release of milk from the breast during lactation. Don't confuse that with the uh, prolactin. Prolactin stimulates the milk production. Oxytocin triggers the release of the milk. Don't get the two mixed up. Um, it's also, we've talked about positive feedback and negative feedback systems. The oxytocin that stimulates contraction also makes the contraction stronger. So that's like a negative feedback Sorry, that's a positive feedback system. Um, ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin, that acts on the kidneys to reduce the urine volume and prevent dehydration. So it actually acts on your kidneys to uh, not secrete water into the urine and the kidneys will reabsorb it back into the bloodstream. Um, the nerve fibers that form the posterior pituitary originate in the hypothalamus and the hypothalamic neurons synthesize the hormones, which, like I said, are stored in the posterior pituitary until it's stimulated to release them. Okay, so the uh, secretion of the pituitary hormones occurs in phases or in pulses. Hormone secretion is controlled by the central nervous system and by the target organs through negative feedback. For example, uh, cold stimulates the hypothalamus to release the thyrotropin releasing hormone which then stimulates the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. That thyroid stimulating hormone then tells the thyroid to release some thyroid hormones. Those hormones stimulate metabolism uh, that increases warmth and then and it also inhibits the release of thyroid stimulating hormone by the pituitary so it kind of feeds back on itself. It's a little confusing. Um, might need to review it a couple of times to uh, get it straight. The pineal gland, or pineal gland, I'm really not sure how you say it, I say pineal. It's located on the roof of the brain's third ventricle. This is the gland that produces melatonin. This is a hormone that goes, rises and levels at nighttime when there's no sunlight, and it falls during the day. High melatonin levels trigger sleepiness, so it makes it a key factor in your sleep and your wake cycle. It also may regulate the timing of puberty. The thymus gland. This lies in the mediastinum just beneath the sternum. So you can see it right here on this picture, right here. In children, the thymus gland is pretty large and it starts to shrink when you reach puberty. By adulthood or um, old age, depending on what you consider old age, it's mostly fat and fibrous tissue. The thymus gland secretes thymosin and thymopoietin, and these have a role in the development of the immune system. Because it secretes hormones, it's considered part of the endocrine system. The actions of the hormones make it also make it a part of the immune system. So it's one of those, it's a part of two different body systems. 
thyroid. This is maybe one of the more commonly known glands. It's the largest of the endocrine glands. It consists of two large lobes connected by a narrow band of tissue called the isthmus. And you can see that right here. It's really not delineated like that, but it is um, just a really narrow band. Uh, it, it's in your neck. It kind of wraps around the front and side portions of your trachea. Thyroid is made up of tissues, tiny little sacs called thyroid follicles. And each follicle is filled with a really kind of a thick fluid called thyroid colloid, a lot of oids. Uh, the cells lining the sac secrete the two main thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Uh, the other names for T3 and T4 is triiodothyronin and thyroxin. Um, if you just remember T4 is thyroxin, you don't need to try to remember how to pronounce the other name for T3. Um, the thyroid is unique in that, unlike any of the other glands, it can store its own, its own hormones for later use. Cells between the thyroid follicles, and you can see here this is one of the thyroid follicles, the cells between them are the parafollicular cells. These secrete the hormone calcitonin in response to rising blood calcium levels. Calcitonin then triggers the deposit of calcium into bone, and um, that results in um, promoting bone formation and bringing blood calcium levels down lower. <coughs> the parathyroid glands, uh, there's usually, and most people have four of them. Uh, some people may have fewer, some people may have one or two more. Uh, it varies, and their location varies, but they're mostly found on the posterior surface of the thyroid. Posterior, you remember, means the back surface, so it's towards the back of your neck. They secrete the parathyroid hormone, that kind of makes sense, in response to low blood levels of calcium. Parathyroid hormone is the main hormone used to maintain normal blood levels of calcium. Um, and you remember, calcium is responsible um, adequate levels of calcium is really very important for nerve and muscle function. You remember that from when we did the muscle system and the nervous system and the need for calcium with uh, impulse transmission and um, muscle contraction. Calcium is also re um, responsible, very, very important in blood clotting and cell, main, cell membrane permeability and the function of some certain enzymes. The parathyroid hormone inhibits new bone formation and it stimulates the breakdown of old bones causing calcium and uh, by extension phosphate to move out of the bone and into the blood. It encourages the kidneys to reabsorb calcium so the kidneys won't excrete it into the urine. And it also prompts the kidneys to activate vitamin D, which is uh, something that's needed for intestinal absorption of calcium. Calcium homeostasis, this is a little chart that kind of illustrates that. Um, if you have high blood calcium levels, your thyroid hormone is going to re release calcitonin. Calcitonin is going to prompt the move of, of calcium from the blood into the bones, and then the blood calcium levels decrease, hopefully to normal levels. If the blood calcium level is low, sorry, well, let's get up here. Blood calcium level is low. The parathyroid releases the parathyroid hormone, which causes uh, calcium to move from the bones into the bloodstream. It also works on the kidneys, remember, to um, reabsorb calcium and to activate vitamin D so that calcium can be absorbed from your intestines into the blood. And then the levels will increase back to normal. So that's when I wanted to do this, and then back to the normal. It's a constant back and forth action like a lot of things in your body, and it's a constant need to maintain that homeostasis. So we're gonna move on to the adrenal glands now. Adrenal, and actually each adrenal gland is two distinct glands, because again, why would we make it easy? The inner portion is called the adrenal medulla, and that's really modified neurons, and it functions as part of the, as part of the sympathetic nervous system. And if you remember, sympathetic nervous system is what um, causes your heart rate and your breathing to speed up. The outer portion is called the adrenal cortex. That's glandular tissue, and that secretes steroid hormones known as corticosteroids. The adrenal medulla has modified neurons um, that are the ones that act as part of the sympathetic nervous system. These cells secrete catecholamines known as 
epinephrine and norepinephrine in response to stimulation. These catecholamines prepare the body for physical activity by increasing the heart rate and blood pressure, stimulating circulation to the muscles, and dilating the bronchioles. They also boost glucose levels, because remember glucose is a source of fuel, um, and it does that by breaking down glycogen into glucose and converting fatty acids and amino acids into glucose. Um, and then, of course, the adrenal cortex, um, because there's more subdivisions of everything, the adrenal cortex has three layers of glandular tissue. The outer layer secretes mineral, mineral corticoids. The middle layer secretes glucocorticoids. And the innermost layer secretes sex steroids. I'm not going to expect you to know the names of those layers, but I do want you to know which layer secretes which type of hormones. So we can talk about these a little more. Mineral, mineral. I have trouble with this word, I'm sorry. Mineral corticoids, um, aldosterone really, acts on the kidneys to uh, promote sodium retention and excretion of potassium. Uh, and of course water follows sodium, so water is going to follow the sodium and stay within the body and within the bloodstream. Cortisol is the principal glucocorticoid. That helps the body adapt to stress. It repairs damaged tissues by stimulating the breakdown of fat and protein and converting fat and protein to glucose. It also stimulates the release of fatty acids and glucose into the blood. Cortisol has an anti-inflammatory effect, and that's what I really want you to remember about that. It suppresses the immune system if it's secreted over long term, and it's essential for maintaining a normal blood pressure. The sex steroids include a weak form of androgen, and that's converted to the more potent um, androgen testosterone and small amounts of estrogen. Um, the adrenal gland is a very busy one, uh, like all our other glands, and it really does a lot. Not as much as a pituitary, but it does quite a lot. The pancreas. Pancreas contain both endocrine and exo exocrine tissues. The majority of the pancreas acts as an exocrine gland, which means it um, secretes its digestive enzymes into ducts that drain into the small intestine. We're going to learn more about that when we talk about the digestive system. But uh, um, scattered around in, in uh, among in with the exocrine cells, I was trying to think of a better way to say that, are clusters of endocrine cells called pancreatic islets or islets of Langer hands. And that's L-A-N-G-E-R-H-A-N-S. These um, islets contain alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Alpha cells secrete the hormone glucagon between meals when your blood glucose levels drop. The glucagon stimulates the liver cells to convert glycogen into glucose and also to convert fatty acids and amino acids into glucose. The result is um, more glucose is released into the bloodstream and your blood glucose levels go up. Beta cells secrete the hormone insulin. After eating, the levels of glucose and amino acids in the blood increase. And this is how I remember insulin and increase. If your glucose levels increase, your beta cells are going to secrete insulin. Insulin stimulates cells to absorb these nutrients, causing blood glucose levels to decline. That's when I remember when we talked about the cells and there were some um, receptors on the wall, the cell membrane that acted as channels. Um, that the only way things could get in there was through those channels with those receptors. This is one of them. And then the delta cells secrete somatostatin, a hormone that works within the pancreas to regulate all the other endocrine cells. Um, it inhibits the release of glucagon, insulin, and the growth hormone. So we're not going to talk about diabetes really, although diabetes is really what um, is associated with the pancreas and the regulation of blood glucose. But I do want you to understand how the hormones from your pancreas work. So after you're eating, when your blood glucose levels rise, um, because the glucose is being absorbed from what you eat into your bloodstream from the digestive tract, um, that stimulates the beta cells to, sec to secrete insulin. And I also remember beta cells and insulin because B and IN make the word bin. The insulin triggers two reactions. It stimulates the cells to take up more glucose, and it also stimulates the liver to take up glucose and store it as glycogen. And the result of that is that, ideally, the blood glucose levels return to normal. Okay, so then when your blood glucose levels drop, like when you skip a meal, 
Then the alpha cells of your pancreas will release glucagon into the blood. That glucagon goes to the liver and stimulates the liver to break down that glycogen that it stored earlier, um, break it down into glucose, which is then released into the bloodstream, and this causes the glucose levels to rise. I'm going to cover very quickly because we're going to talk about these more with the reproductive system are the gonads, the ovaries and the testes. The primary sex organs of the females are the ovaries and the primary sex organs of the males are the testes. The ovaries secrete estrogen and the testes secrete testosterone. Um, there is a cycle associated with all that. Like I said, we're not going to, I'm not going to go into that in a lot, de lot of detail. Um, we're going to cover that more with the reproductive system. And that's the endocrine system in a nutshell. I do have a couple of things I'm going to be posting on Schoology for you as far as the regulation of um, calcium levels and the regulation of, in, uh, sorry, glucose levels, which is a big function of, you know, a couple of different um, endocrine glands. And don't forget, there's also uh, medical terminology that you're going to need to know. And uh, that's it for this week.